Right, welcome back everybody. Um, now, in this next session, we're going to hear from two of the leading investors in the sector, Jim Mellon and Jeremy Collar. Uh, the plan is that uh, both of the, uh, the presenters will, will, will work through their, uh, their talks and then they will take questions together at the end. Um, so please do continue to submit your questions through the Q&A function and we will do our best to relay as many of those as we can during the session. I should also add that any questions that we don't get around to uh, to answering today, which is likely to be most of them, um, we will endeavour to, uh, to, to to review after the event and Master Investor will be using its blogs and content going forwards to uh, attempt to answer some of those at the very least. So without further ado, um, first up we have Jim Mellon. Jim is an investor, entrepreneur, and author of Moo's Law. Um, so without further ado, I will hand over to Jim. Uh, thanks, Tim. Hello, everyone. Um, I'm in Dubai with uh, Anthony Chow, who some of you know, who uh, works with me uh, on the our clean meat investments. Um, you know, my sister got married about 20 years ago. One of my sisters, I've got three of them. And um it took place in the isle of man uh we went to the church and one of her friends got up and read out uh, some an extract from the rubiat of omar khayyam and um uh, which was lovely and then another one of her dear friends got up immediately afterwards and read out exactly the same thing so there is the danger that there's going to be some repetition in what you're going to hear uh, today. And so I'm going to try and talk a bit off uh, my presentation off the slides, I mean, away from the slides, because otherwise, uh, Dr. Claire Trippett's excellent presentation, and no doubt Jeremy Collar's amazing presentation that's yet to come uh, might overlap with mine. So I want to just give you some uh, personal input that might be away from the, uh, the, the slides that I'd actually prepared. Uh, everyone knows, uh, because we've just been told by Bruce in, in uh, no uncertain terms, and Bruce, by the way, has become a friend and wrote the introduction to my recent book, Moose Law, which I'll talk a little bit about, uh, and the uh, profits of the book will go to the Good Food Institute, which is an amazing uh, advocacy group, uh, which is making already a huge impact on uh, this area of intensive farming. Um, but Bruce talked uh, about some of the environmental and negative impacts uh, on human health of this intensive farming uh, that has really overtaken the world in the last uh, 60 or 70 years because intensive farming was only a small fraction of agriculture in the United States before the Second World War and now it's 99% of agriculture uh, and in Europe it's around 90%. So the images that we might have from our childhood or in our minds of bucolic cattle in green fields, uh, chewing the cud and gambling lambs uh, is a very false uh, reality. Uh, it's a fact that the chickens that we eat today are three times on average the size of the chickens that we ate in or people ate in 1950. Those chickens live in horrible conditions, hardly able to move, uh, with distended bodies, um, and they live for an average of 23 days. Uh, dairy cattle uh, are in a permanent state of pregnancy because otherwise they don't produce milk. The dairy calves are ripped away from them uh, so they can carry on being made pregnant and therefore producing uh, milk on a continuous basis. And the average dairy cow, and I think most people won't know this, lives for less than three years, normally around two years, because their others get so big, their backs break. If a dairy cow was left out in a field, it would live somewhere between 15 and 25 years. So short, brutish, inhumane treatment of animals is the feature of this world. And as Bruce mentioned earlier on, uh, the intensive farming of animals poses a great risk to us as well. We could have, if we don't do something about it, uh, a black death type pandemic. We've had a pandemic in the last year which has interrupted and still continues to interrupt all our lives. Surely we don't not want another one that potentially could kill up to a third of the world's population. We need to do something 
about the situation. We need to do it now. And of course, the greenhouse gas emissions are a matter of great debate about what percentage of uh, emissions come from intensive farming, but it's a very big percentage. And probably intensive farming is the single most, the single biggest man-made uh, activity that leads to, uh, to climate change and global warming. Um, the last thing I'll say about this, supplementary to what uh, uh, Bruce and Dr. Claire said, is that uh, 80,000 living animals, which are then killed, are eaten by the average of Amer American uh, during their, the course of their, on average, 80-year lifetime. That's an, a phenomenal number, uh, and it's one that should give us pause for thought. 80 billion animals are killed every year for meat uh, at any point point in time, there are more animals alive uh, in intensive farms than there are human beings, about 10 billion, and 2 trillion fish are killed each year for human consumption. It's uh, something that if you haven't looked at the various uh, videos of the ways in which animals are treated and ultimately killed, and you haven't looked uh, or read some of the books that are out there, at the back of my book, Moose Law, there's uh, a bibliography and a videography uh, that uh, you might want to peruse to see just how bad this situation is. So in my household, we don't eat meat and haven't done for uh, quite a number of years. Um, and uh, hopefully in many other households, the meat that people will be eating will not come from slaughtered animals, but will come from plants and ultimately from Cell, cells uh, extracted humanely from animal species. So this is my motivation, and I think it probably is one of Jeremy's key motivations as well, to be involved uh, in this industry at the early stage, to provide capital and guidance to companies so that we can uh, accelerate this revolution. It's a revolution that's necessary, uh, and it's a revolution that uh, we, uh, uh, in my own company, believe in so strongly and uh, we'll do everything we can to accelerate. So um, Dr. Claire and uh, Bruce talked a bit about uh, how this revolution is unfolding. The first is obviously that plant-based proteins have taken off um, in all sorts of ways in recent years. That's partly because the products have improved. They're no longer the sort of cardboard type uh, products that were originally eaten by uh, vegans and vegetarians. Um, they are now uh, tasty. Uh, they're getting down towards what I call griddle parity, which is the price point at which they match conventional food, although they're not quite there yet. Um, and they've got, some companies have uh, developed techniques for manufacturing them and distributing them that have made them very large companies indeed, including, of course, the famous uh, Beyond Meat, which is now a uh, public uh, company in the United States, an extremely valuable public company. You've also had the uh, dairy uh, substitute companies have come along. And if you go into Starbucks now compared to 10 years ago, there's a, a dazzling array of uh, plant-based milks. Uh, and that's before the fermented milks come on the market, which are going to be even more sensational from companies like Perfect Day. Um, and uh, those milks, which range from uh, soya to almond to oats are now a big uh, part of the market share and have, and have driven uh, the biggest dairy producers in the United States, Dean Foods and Borden, uh, into bankruptcy because the tipping point in these low margin industries is not very, uh, not very difficult to achieve um, if there are interlopers and usurpers. Um, the plant-based milk industry is a very good precursor for what's going to happen in meat, seafood, and in materials. This is the first wave. The second wave is, uh, second and third wave actually concurrently, um, are the picks and shovels, which Claire described earlier on, the bioreactors, the media, the growth factors that go up, uh, go to make the, um, uh, the cell-based foods that we're so excited about. Uh, and uh, my book is called Moose Law because the price of those inputs is following the trajectory of Moore's law, which is the famous semiconductor law, which I'll describe in a second, um, which uh, means that the trajectory of price should bring us at some point uh, to griddle parity with cell ag products, even though at the moment they're substantially more expensive um, than the conventional foods, the trajectory is very much 
uh, one which will take them down to below conventional food prices. Uh, and cellular agriculture doesn't just, uh, it's not just represented by meat, obviously, and seafood, but also by dairy proteins, and that will be a very big market. Companies like Legendary, which I believe is speaking uh, later on, perfect day out of the United States, are super exciting and, and are addressing a very large market indeed. And then you've also got um, materials. And so already leather is being produced in labs by a company also, which I believe is speaking today, Vitro, uh, where they have commercial contracts already. Uh, and cotton is another area of disruption, plus uh, collagen um, and, of course, threads, uh, all of which are much more appropriately produced uh, in uh, laboratories uh, or what you might call actually lab factories uh, and are easier to get to market than foods and dairy proteins because we don't eat them or most people don't eat cotton and leather and therefore um, they don't need to go through the same regulatory process as uh, cultivated meat, seafood and dairy proteins. However, the cellular agricultural second wave, if you want to put it that way, is not so far away. And as I will describe a little bit later in this presentation, we're pretty close to seeing uh, some of these companies, uh, even this year, on the market uh, with products that can be eaten uh, by uh, consumers in the case of food companies. Uh, I mentioned earlier that the plant-based proteins have taken off. And uh, Bruce mentioned earlier on that uh, you know, the sale, he's going to release uh, figures on uh, plant-based food sales in the United States uh, quite soon, uh, but they are growing quickly and they've grown very rapidly in the pandemic uh, in particular, because even though the restaurants have been largely shut, consumers have been trying out things like uh, Beyond Meat, uh, Impossible Burgers and so forth, uh, because they've been sitting at home and looking for something new and something potentially healthier and something better for the environment. Um, the uh, leaders in this field are clearly uh, impossible uh, uh, beyond and in the UK meatless farms, um, as well as, of course, uh, you know, the, uh, the, 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 the main, the, the large food companies which produce their own lines of plant-based um, plant foods. And the reason that these foods have become better is because the technique of manufacturing them has become better and the use of things such as pea protein have made them more palatable and in the case of uh, Impossible, the use of hemoglobin um, or, or heme, as they call it, uh, to add a sort of crunchiness, or in the case of Beyond Meat beet juice, to add a sort of uh, the look of bleeding burgers, um, has been a big factor in, uh, in the take up of these plant-based foods. Um, in terms of getting to griddle parity, when the price of these foods reaches uh, the price of conventional foods, we're looking at somewhere around 18 months uh, and then the uptake could be even bigger because at the moment they are still more expensive um, than buying the conventional intensively farmed uh, foods. Um, but they are getting cheaper, uh, but there is a point at which they will stop uh, improving in terms of price. They will definitely improve in terms of health uh, and uh, they will improve in terms of distribution but they will not get down, in my opinion, to significantly below the price of conventional foods for all sorts of reasons, but mostly to do with the inputs, which are still and will remain relatively expensive compared to ultimately the production of cell ag foods at scale uh, when the, the price of those can go significantly below those of conventional foods. But the real disruption of agriculture is occurring because of cell agriculture. And uh, Bruce and Dr. Clare, um, you know, describe this extremely well. So any species at all um, can be disrupted. Any material at all uh, that can be grown in the lab is disruptive of, or potentially disruptive of the industry, um, which is the conventional industry. Uh, we're starting, obviously, uh, with cows, but there's also pigs, there's chickens, there's ducks, there's seafood. Um, there's infant formula, there's cotton, uh, there's threads, as I mentioned earlier on. So anything from which a stem cell sample uh, or a sample of DNA can be extracted can be produced in a lab uh, without uh, genetic manipulation, uh, but it, without also toxins, hormones, antibiotics, uh, mercury in the case of seafood. And uh, it can pre be produced uh, in large quantities 
uh, uh, in due course. And in that, in due course, Claire said about five years, and I would agree with that assessment. I think that's the um, that that's the period that we're looking at for large mass scale production of these type of products. Claire also mentioned, uh, and I think Bruce did as well, the first uh, burger uh, was unveiled by Professor Mark Post. Uh, it, it was showcased in London in 2013. And what's interesting is that um, after that showcasing, uh, the funding really, uh, and Mark Post left one post and went to another, and uh, there wasn't very much funding. But I'll sit in the last few years, there's been an improvement in funding. So although it's only seven years ago that this was unveiled, two or three of those years were effectively lost years. Um, that costs around $300,000, as Claire mentioned. Today, the price is around $10, and you can see that the trajectory is very positive, but we do need to get that price down below 50 cents, which is the price of the average burger patty, and that is what Moo's Law is all about. Um, the Moore's Law, the original semiconductor law, has been in existence now for 55 years. Gordon Moore invented it 55 years ago, or came up with that law. And uh, in that period, um, you know, the chip performance has roughly doubled every 18 months, and the price has roughly halved every 18 months. And that's why we have such phenomenal uh, chips today. Um, the first five megabytes, which uh, most people on this call will never have encountered uh, of data storage uh, in 1956, occupied the whole of the cargo bay of a Pan American uh, jet liner. Um, and today, although I see that this thing is only a four gigabyte uh, USB stick, you can get four uh, terabyte USB sticks. Um, and uh, obviously, they, that's all been due to Moore's law, and, uh, Moore's law, and Moore's law will be similar. We're going to have phenomenal increases in production and phenomenal falls in prices as a result of the uh, of the efforts of scientists and industrialists in the cell ag space. Um, the principal cost at the moment, as Claire said, is media, which includes the growth factors. Um, we are very optimistic in our analysis that. For a start, uh, FBS or fetal, fetal bovine syndrome will not be used by uh, companies in the future. And most of the companies that we invest in are not using uh, FBS right now. Um, we are also uh, very optimistic that the media cost, which is the nutrients that the stem cells are bathed in in order to produce the meats and other products that we're so excited about, will also come down dramatically in scale. And as an example, solar foods, which is the company that produces food right out of thin air. Um, and I'm sure you'll hear about that later on. Uh, the stuff that they produce, the proteins, could well be used uh, in feeding uh, or in acting as a component of media for the production of cell ag. And obviously, the price of that will be significantly lower than the current uh, media. I got into this, uh, uh, this area uh, as an investor and uh, as an advocate um, partly because of my uh, love of animals and the, the, my hatred of the current uh, process of producing animals, but also because I'm in the biotech business as a day job. And some of the processes used in this industry are effectively biotech processes. Uh, Claire mentioned that you know the biotech prices are extremely uh, high, or the, 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 the media and the, um, uh, the, the growth factors used in biotech are extremely high. And the reason that they're so high uh, is partly because there's been no real incentive to get them lower uh, because the margins in biotech are so high. So the cost of production relative to the cost of the, of the finished good is very low. Um, and, uh, but in food, obviously, we need to get the price of the media and we need to get the price of the, uh, the growth factors down significantly because people are not going to pay bio biotech type prices for um, food. And it's the same with the bioreactors. Bioreactors at the moment are produced by a few specialists and highly profitable companies. Um, those uh, bioreactors need to be scaled up dramatically to 20,000 liters and then on to 100,000 liters, up from the current maximum of around 2,000 uh, liters capacity. And the prices have to come down. And But I'm absolutely certain that that will happen. Uh, the question is when. Um, and uh, so the faster this happens, the better. Um, if you take uh, the amount of meat that's eaten in the UK as an example, 
Uh, it's a very large uh, amount. Uh, the population of the UK is described here as 25 million. I hope that it's not. Um, it's around 60 million. Um, but uh, the number of cells to feed the UK population is 6.4 quintillion per annum. So obviously, the scale up of this opportunity has got to be absolutely dramatic. The execution risk among companies is the, is the greatest uh, pitfall that we face as investors, because that is a, an enormous task. And these companies, which are mostly quite new, mostly only recently funded uh, with reasonable amounts of money, um, uh, are you know, vulnerable to execution risk. And that's something that we look at very closely in terms of our investments uh, in the sector. Claire described cellular agriculture. I won't go into it um, in, in any detail, but you can see that basically you take a, a biopsy from a cow, about 2.5 milliliters, which is about the size of one of my fingernails, um, and uh, over 40 days, uh, you can produce seven to eight cows worth of, uh, of uh, beef, uh, and uh, it would take uh, rather than 40 days of those cows being grown uh, in feedlots, which is what, where most cows end up, um, they, that would take about uh, 28 months. So there's a dramatic time acceleration on this. Um, and obviously, uh, there are no cows involved, no waste, there's no uh, hide, uh, there's no, uh, you know, parts of the, of the cow body that are not required. So this is pure beef that comes out. Um, and from a 2.5 milliliter sample, you end up with 3000 kilos uh, or seven or eight cows worth of meat, which is absolutely incredible. And that's the objective of the companies that are producing meat and similarly with other species as well. Um, so all of these companies that we invest in have uh, product prototypes. This is not some sort of uh, idea that's being dreamt up on a lab bench um, and uh, you know is currently being worked on. They all have something that you can taste, all that you can feel, all that can be used actually. Um, and uh, as Lou Cooperhouse will tell you later on, Lou Nalu expects, as an example, to be on the market with its uh, uh, cell-based uh, fillets um, of Mahi Mahi, um, which is its first product, uh, by the end of this year with the approval of the FDA in the United States. Uh, the other speakers have mentioned that uh, Eat Just uh, is on the market in Singapore already with a chicken-based cell-produced uh, uh, product. Uh, and in Israel, you've got super meat uh, with the same, uh, not the same product, but a chicken based product that's already on the market. Um, and you'll get a serious ramp up in, in due course. And the first countries to adopt this will, in my opinion, be uh, the United States, which is the clear leader in the technology, um, followed by Europe, followed by um, Israel and followed by Singapore. Um, and uh, the, the regulatory pathways, however, will be accelerated in countries where there is food insecurity, where they have to import a lot of their food. Uh, I'm in the Middle East because Anthony and I are talking to a, a large institutions here, which are very interested uh, in this whole process, because in the UAE, where we are at the moment, 95% of food is imported. But even in big countries, uh, you have food insecurity. So the UK, uh, my own country, um, 50% of food is imported. And as no one, I think, on this call will remember, but um, the, uh, in the Second World War, the UK came close to starvation because the German submarines were sinking the ships from the United States as the food was imported. Um, and that same vulnerability exists today. I'm not talking about war, but we are in a position of potential precariousness because of uh, the supply chains dependent on food imports. And it's entirely possible that countries like the UAE the Kingdom of Saudi Arabia, Hong Kong, Singapore, which are very food insecure, could end up producing a much bigger part of their food production as a result of this uh, dramatic change in uh, agriculture that we're uh, undergoing at the moment. Um, you're also, of course, in plant-based foods, getting some uh, pretty substantial companies coming to market. Oatly, which is the Swedish-based um, uh, company that makes oat milk, uh, is likely to go public shortly at a rumored $10 billion valuation. Um, you've also got Live Kindly, which is featured here on the right-hand side of the slide, which is a sort of agglomeration of uh, chicken-based, uh, plant-based products. Um, and that's likely to go public as well. We don't know what the 
uh, price will be, but it will be in the billions of dollars. So there is um, some pretty exciting uh, times ahead for investors in this area. And of course, you know, the, uh, I'm always asked, as is Anthony and, and Laura from our team, will people actually try this cultivated uh, food? And the answer is, well, lots of surveys have been done that indicate that they will try it. Uh, and I think that Lou, with his first, probably the first major product on the market, which is seafood, will find it relatively easy to penetrate the market because, you know, it's clear to people who feed children um, that, you know, fish as currently is uh, either farmed or is uh, uh, fished from the ocean um, is uh, a big carrier of toxins, including mercury and microplastics. Uh, and the alternative for the, the, the cultivated uh, seafood doesn't have that sort of stuff. And it will become clearer to consumers as well that, you know, producing food uh, either through plants or through laboratories um, is great for the environment, but it's also great for human health. And, and uh, you know, uh, one in six people in the United States goes to uh, a doctor or to a hospital every year because of um, contaminated food, largely meat. Uh, and that uh, obviously is, a, is an unacceptable figure. And so something has to be done about that there. So consumers are very likely in lots of surveys to buy both plant-based and cultivated uh, meat products. Um, and uh, so once these products get to scale, um, they should sell very well. But the most important thing is that uh, people are influenced by taste, texture, familiarity, and by price, as Bruce said earlier on. And we have to get the price down because uh, if the prices remain much higher than conventional foods, it will take much longer for these foods to be adopted. And they do need to be adopted. We actually need to get uh, the production of animal protein down for the sake of the planet and for the sake of our own health. Uh, there are, as Bruce said, about 80 companies in the field. We think about 30 of them are investable. Um, I describe these companies in the recent book, Moose Law. Um, we think about $1.3 billion, uh, depends how you define it, has gone into the sector so far. Some familiar faces are, are in, investing in this area. Horizon Ventures from Hong Kong, Tamasek from Singapore. Uh, some of the big uh, food producers like Tyson and Cargill are investing. Um, SoftBank is uh, dipping its toe in the water. Richard Branson seems to appear in everything, um, and he's investing as well. And the leading companies are include Memphis Meats, which I think will be one of the comp first companies to go public. Uh, Blue Nalu, which uh, I don't know, uh, but I suspect at some point uh, Blue Nalu will, will go public. Um, and you've got um, companies such as uh, uh, Just Eat, of course, which uh, is likely to go public, uh, I think, in the relatively uh, near future. Um, uh, and then, of course, the dairy product companies, and including Perfect Day, are likely to tap the public markets, especially since uh, they will be completely novel investments. There are, there are no cell ag or fermentation companies that are public at the moment. Um, so the, 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 with the SPAC uh, mania that's going on at the moment, I would imagine that some of these companies will fit very nicely and neatly um, into uh, the SPAC structures. Um, the, these are some of the valuations. Uh, I think they're, uh, they're, they're low at the moment. Uh, these are based on uh, prior uh, valuations, but I've heard today that Impossible has been recently valued at $7 billion. Memphis Meat is probably in the billion dollar range. Just Eat is uh, over a billion dollars. So some of these companies are, are getting up there and, um, uh, uh, and no doubt there will be several, if not dozens of billion dollar companies in this field because this is a very, very big market. The meat market around the world is estimated to be about the size of the Spanish economy, about $1.4 trillion. And if it carries on on the, uh, the curve that Bruce indicated uh, on his slide, it'll be the size of the UK economy, about $2.6 trillion uh, within 10 years. So it's, a, it's a, a very large prize for these companies. And of course, seafood is around $300 billion. And on top of that, you've got an addressable market in the materials, which is in the billions trillions rather. So we're looking at an addressable market of at least $5 trillion. This is an extremely large market. Put that in context, the worldwide pharmaceutical market is only $1.4 trillion. So there is a very, very big upside to the companies that get it right, which is um, what we and what uh, people like Jeremy are trying to 
uh, find. In other words, the best management teams, the best opportunity, the best white spaces, uh, the best defensible IP, um, and uh, the best funded companies uh, that can take their products uh, onto the market in the shortest space of time and in a safe way. Uh, there's, in, in terms of amazing opportunities to come, structured meat, which uh, Dr. Claire talked about briefly, I think will be a big thing. I mean, at the moment, the prize is mostly in, in minced uh, or ground beef products because about 50% of all meat in the world is, is ground. Uh, it's easier to make that uh, and um, it's, it's a, it's a low-hanging fruit. Um, and that'll be one area. Uh, pet food is going to be a very big market, um, quite clearly. Uh, $75 billion global market is waiting for disruption. Um, and then in infant formula, uh, it's more of a thing in Asia than it is in Europe, but uh, many women in, in Asia don't breastfeed their babies, they use formula and there's been issues with contamination. Um, it's a massive market, um, you know, New Zealand's biggest industry is producing infant formulas. Um, and uh, uh, so uh, that's ripe for disruption and that's an area that investors uh, in this field, and there are not very many investors, uh, such as Jeremy or ourselves at the moment, are looking at extremely closely. We, we like that as a potential market. So cell agriculture is in its infancy. It's going to be a multi-trillion dollar industry. The first wave is in plants. Then there's the cell agriculture, the picks and shovels. Um, I think that uh, uh, Moore's law continues on its trajectory, maybe even faster than Moore's law, and that griddle parity could be achieved within the next five years with cell ag products. That might be a little bit optimistic, but nonetheless, it's going to happen within our lifetimes. It's going to be absolutely disruptive. And we're beginning to see significant institutional capital beyond uh, mission-driven people uh, like, like Jeremy um, or Chris Kerr uh, or, or us. Um, uh, some very large institutions beginning to dip a toe into this field. And that always bodes well uh, for investors. So I'm, I'm super excited about this area. I think it's one of the greatest money fountains uh, out there, along with uh, climate change, longevity, uh, and possibly space. Um, and so uh, I urge everyone uh, to, if you can, to read the book. I've interviewed 35 people, including Jeremy and Bruce, who wrote the foreword of the book. Um, and uh, uh, they have very, very uh, kindly contributed their ideas and thoughts uh, to it. Um, and it's a, it's a snapshot of how the industry um, is today. And I also urge you to sign up for uh, newsletters from, uh, from Jeremy and, of course, from the Good Food Institute, um, which will keep you informed of the really startling developments in the field. And with that, I thank you very much uh, for attending and taking the time out of your day to, to listen to all of us. Thank you, Jim. That was uh, absolutely fascinating. Um, now, Jim will return uh, for questions shortly. Um, first of all, however, our, uh, our next speaker is Jeremy Collar. Uh, Jeremy is founder and CIO of Collar Capital, known as the godfather of secondaries and founder of the Collar Fair Initiative and CPT. Um, so uh, I will shut up and hand over to Jeremy. Hi, hi guys. Um, so, um, you know, I died uh, April the 15th, 2013 at the age of 54. Just telling you um, wh why I got into this. And um, my obituary said that um, I, I built Collar Capital into, uh, you know, as a pioneer leader of the second private equity secondaries market, which is close to nine billion fund but that I'm a total bore. And, um, and that really got me thinking, a, a friend wrote it as a wake up call to me. And it got me thinking that, um, you know, I've been vegetarian since I'm 12. I, and, and yet I was a bystander. I had never done anything to, to be an animal rights activist in any way. I'd never become an upstander. And so I had a light bulb moment that, well, um, uh, oops, a light bulb moment, um, that uh, a light bulb moment that I wanted to uh, become an upstander. And what did that mean? So, you know, as Bruce and Jim and Claire and everyone's talked about, you've got to come up with 
Um, I'm a chief investment officer by background. And, um, and so, you know, looking through that lens, how can you make any difference in the world? And so I started an ESG network. First, we came up with the investment risks, which we've all just talked about. But it's a different way of looking at it. You know, we know that antibiotics, number one user of antibiotics worldwide, number one user of fresh water, number one cause of deforestation, endangers food security, more greenhouse gases than the whole of the transport sector. You know, so you come up with that and we've all talked about that. But if you see these as four weapons of mass destruction, um, how do you translate that into animal rights? So we came up with investment risks and set up uh, an ESG network um, uh, to to look at to look through the lens as an as an investor. Sorry, I've got my slides. As an investor, and and you're not only highlighting the risk. So a group of people got together, and a group of institutions have got together, and um, it's actually the fastest growing ESG network in the world. It's over thirty trillion dollars now. And so that looked at the risks through the lens of an investor and um, CPT Capital is actually on the other side looking for solutions because people like their burgers, et cetera. And one of the first engagements that um, FAIR organized, Farm Animal Investment Risk and Return, was working with uh, looking at the restaurant chains in 2016 that was our first engagement. We went with $4.9 trillion, 74 investors, and asked uh, McDonald's and Wendy's and Garden and uh, Burger King, et cetera, what are they doing about antibiotics in the food supply system? Not one of them had an antibiotics policy. And the reason why investors would look at this as a potential investment risk is you've had Yum Brands, which is KFC, um, collapsing each time there's an avian flu epidemic, et cetera. There could be a class action. Um, there's, been, there's been various uh, uh, issues with a demand led as well, because people don't want to eat so much antibiotics at all anymore. And by, because we went to these restaurant chains and exposed them as, you know, it could be regulatory or class actions, et cetera, Within three, three years, all 20 restaurant chains had, um, had, had, had policies, uh, antibiotic policies to phase out antibiotics as everyday use. So my, I've got two asks on this, on this uh, presentation. One is if you would look at fair.org and um, uh, you know, it's about engaging with 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 corporates it's about looking it's about researching and engaging it's about materiality not morality and and it's a it's a it's um a free organization to join for any investor however large or small i mean the large investors include calpers in the us and um A aberdeen uh standard chartered in uh is aberdeen standard in the UK, et cetera. Um, so it's a range of companies, there's family offices as well, but that's the power of ownership. Now, what that's translated into is um, there's the demand side, which is, which is which changing the corporates, but there's also been a massive demand as, as, as all the previous speakers have spoken about. You know, if once the seed, seed of innovation is planted, the cycle of technological improvements is irresistible. And it started out with the factory farm. You know, we've, for the last 80 years, we've grown these factory farms to be the best, most efficient provider of meat, et cetera. But in the 21st century, in the 21st century, why would you brew milk in the breast of a cow when you can brew it in a brewery? It doesn't make any sense. And so, you know, what's happening to this alternative protein market is it's growing dramatically. Here you can see that growth um, compared to conventional meat, which, it, which is falling 
behind. Um, and, and the incumbents are taking note of this. You've got Tysons who have rebranded themselves as a protein company. You've got um, uh, companies with exposure to alternative proteins by from 2019, the pace of change is so fast. By 2019 to 20, you've got 12 to 18 of the largest companies um, investing it to have exposure to alternative protein. And um, uh, so, and then just as an overview, you know, what, what does it mean, the alternative protein market? And the way we look at it is, is through five different pillars. You've got plant-based, um, which is, which is, um, um, you know, I was invested in Garden Burger about 15 years ago, and uh, it's it bought by, fortunately bought by Kellogg's, um, because it was plants. It was, it was fresh vegetables in a patty. Now, what, what, Burger, but what Beyond Meat have done is use technology of extrusion, etc., to create uh, to create a, a wonderful burger. I've got I've got some sausages I'm going to have here later. Um, you've got you've got uh, creation. Of, you've got recombinant protein, which is um, you know making bio fermenting uh, bacteria or or yeast to create uh, casein or gelatin. It's basically brewing milk. It's exactly, it's modifying uh, the, the cells to ferment them into using them as, um, as, we, as Claire spoke about, etc. And then you've got multiplying of single cells of non-animal origin, which means um, growing algae, um, or microprotein, you know, a lot of people in the UK and, and some in the US would have heard of, um, would have heard of corn. This is biofermenting. Uh, this is culturing microprotein, the fungus, into a, a, a proteins, etc. And you've also got animal cell culture, which is taking a cell from, from an animal and, and growing it. And then you've got enabling technologies besides that. And just Looking at these together, you've got, um, you know, if you put the companies into different, different categories, you've got the plant protein, um, you know, which is all about taste. It's about first mover advantage. It's about brand. You know, the barriers to entry are actually not that great. So it is so important that you've built a brand, et cetera. Then you've got, um, People like the recombinant protein. So companies like Legendary, you've got Rafa, who's going to be speaking let, let, later. This is our, some of our portfolio. And um, or non-animal cell culture. You've got uh, Passy, who's, who's um, you know, food out of thin air, turning hydrogen into protein, etc. Bolt Threads is brewing silk. It's real silk. It's, it's making real silk and, and leather. And then you've got the animal cell culture, which is, um, uh, you know, from animals like, like Blue Nalu, which is uh, growing fish. Edo is uh, doing chicken and blood. And uh, Ingvar is doing in vitro labs. Um, and then you've got the enabling technology, something like redefine meat. We were talking about steaks before. You can try and grow a steak through animal cell culture, which would be very, very difficult. It's easier to do meatballs. It's gonna be much harder to do a steak. But redefine meat is actually 3D printing steaks with streaks of fat, et cetera, coming to an Israeli restaurant this year, hopefully. And uh, you've got the other enabling technology. So redefine meat, it's in both categories. It's an enabler because it's a 3D printer, but they're actually going to be selling the meat directly in restaurants and uh, supermarkets, etc. And you've got companies like Matrix, which are helping with the scaffolding, or Veggie Grill even, which is an enabler because it's in the US you would know that as, um, as a great restaurant chain. And um, so what we look for 
is we invest early. We always back and protect the founders. Um, you know, vision and willing to work 24 seven trumps management ability. I've been in so many startups where the founder is not a good manager and is, and is pushed aside or is uh, replaced a CEO and the company fails. I prefer to go down with the founder and wait till there, I, as having been one myself and, um, and not being a very good manager uh, uh, at all at, for a lot of that period. Uh, vision trumps management ability. Um, and uh, for us, a product always has, food tech can include insects. I'm not a scientist, so we, we won't be invested in any insects, et cetera. Our theme is to invest in animal, not replacing animal derived products. And of course, what uh, Jim was referring to is that uh, the tech and protected IP like the cell culture and recombinant are gonna be much easier to protect than um, than the than plant based, however good plant based is, there's going to be a better plant based a plant product just around the corner. And um, the second ask is that CPT Capital um, is looking um, uh, to increase its team, and uh, I think that the uh, job is on LinkedIn under CPT Capital, CPTcap.com. And uh, just a reminder, we've, we've, we've been speaking about how fantastic, whoops, how fantastic um, food tech is, et cetera. Just as a reminder, there's a number of companies on, on all of our charts that are so overvalued. Please don't forget that a lot of famous people went down with the Titanic. Thank you. Thank you, Jeremy. That was absolutely uh, brilliant. Now, um, let me just bring Jim back in. We've got a number of questions for the pair of you. Um, so I'll start. Um, so first question from uh, James. How can government policy better support this industry? Are the opportunities post-Brexit to remove some of the red tape and position the UK in a similar way to the likes of Singapore, Israel as a progressive hub? Um, Jeremy, if I, if I start with you with, with, with that one. Well, sorry, what was the question? Well, essentially, I think they were asking around, particularly in the context of Brexit, um, how can government better support the industry through policy? I was in. I was in. I was talking in Bahrain about this because they, they talk about food security. They import every every piece of food when they could. You know, they don't have to have cows. They could actually brew milk. Be be ahead of the game and brew milk in a brewery. I don't know if you know Bahrain. The reason it became a financial hub was because um, it put up a it put up a telephone mast. That, uh, you know, so that um, it had very good communications, but. You know, the UK, um, I mean, yes, we need to have a policy, uh, particularly in the UK. I'm, I'm going to talk about the UK because it interests me. But, you know, in the UK, um, post-Brexit, we have an opportunity. Boris's words, we need to free ourselves from the shackles of the EU common agricultural policy. So um, Bruce can enjoy an impossible burger in the US. We can't in Europe yet. And um, so, you know, the biggest action that the UK could do is phase out subsidies. Phasing out subsidies is the biggest motivator for, uh, for making it um, uh, affordable, making the alternatives affordable. And um, I don't know if you know, but the UK is the largest plant-based market in Europe one in every four product launches in 2019 were plant-based. And so, you know, countries mustn't get left behind. I, and as Claire, I think it was Claire mentioned, I, I can't remember mentioned that, that Singapore recently became the first country to approve cultured meat for sale. 
the UK has a chance to be a world leader and it's a great opportunity to remove red tape and streamline approvals. So, you know, we, we, um, we need to invest in innovation and R&D, but also you need to actually have a policy in, uh, for, for moving this forward. And I, th I think you kindly asked our policy director from my foundation to speak, uh, Helena Wright, and she's gonna talk more about that in, in uh, an upcoming session. Great, uh, Jim, anything to add on that point? No, I completely agree with Jeremy. The UK has just recently set up a 375 million pound fund for tech where they match private investment. And I think that's a good model. And uh, clearly this is a tech business. I mean, this isn't uh, anything other than high tech. So uh, entrepreneurs uh, should look to do that. We're, I think our first white space company that we're gonna back will be in the UK. Um, and um, uh, so watch this space for that one. But, you know, Jeremy, myself, and most people on this call want our country to succeed. And uh, uh, we import half of our food. That's a huge bill. Uh, we could reduce that maybe to importing 25% of our food. So let's do it. Yeah. Post Brexit, we want to, we want to, we really want it to succeed as opposed to be screwed. By the way, just to give a plug to Jim. It, I, I saw one of the questions asked, if I may ask the question myself, is how do, how do investors, you know, retail investors, um, smaller investors invest in this space? Uh, agronomics has, has a public vehicle, which is, is perfect for, for, for people to participate in this space, which Jim yeah. happens to run. Well, I, I, actually, I, I, Anthony and, uh, and Laura do the, most of the work, but um, no, I'm, and, and like Jeremy, I put my money where my mouth is, so I, we own uh, at least a quarter of agronomics, so, um, uh, you know, Jeremy and I are both financially committed to this area, and for the long term. And, and, I, and, I, and I talk, and I walk what I eat. <laughs> yeah, very good. <laughs> um. <laughs> I was about to say, Jeremy, we've had a lot of questions about agronomics. Um, hopefully we'll hear a little bit more on that a bit later on. Um, so uh, next question, I'll put it to you first, Jim. Um, to what extent do you think the eventual winners of the cultivated meat revolution already exist? Do you think there is much value to be had in the new starter and uh, Okay, so in, in the book, uh, I talk about companies being sold, being f fold and bold. And the sold, I think will happen because uh, big companies will want to get the IP, a bit like biotech companies are bought by big pharma companies for their uh, technology. And then the big pharma companies distribute the market, the drugs. I think the same thing will happen with some of the companies in uh, both Jeremy's and our portfolio. Uh, the second is that the, some companies will fold and you know, that's, a, that's the nature of the game. There'll be ones that just don't succeed. And already in the agronomics portfolio, we have a couple that I'm not saying they're folding, but are, are, not, are not as rapidly uh, advancing as the other ones in the portfolio. So I can see that happening. And the last thing is bold. And uh, companies that go out on their own and, and you know, start to really uh, become brand names in their own right. And um, I see the smiling face of Lou Cooper House uh, uh, in, in sort of waiting to talk quite soon. And I think both Jeremy and I would agree that Blue Nali is a company that could be one of the bold, is likely to be one of the bold ones that will go out on its own uh, and do extremely well. So um, in terms of new ones, undoubtedly, both Jeremy and ourselves, we see new ones coming up, um, which are really exciting. Uh, and so there will be new ones and some of the existing ones will do some really well and some of them won't do so well. It's the, it's the way of uh, any nascent industry. Um, so diversification is very important. I, uh, you know, we, we have to have a spread of investments because we don't know exactly which one is going to do the best, but we do know that some of them will do really well. Thank you. Thank you. Jeremy, your, your view on that? Ditto. 
That was nice. That was nice. <laughs> <laughs> uh, and by the way, Jeremy and I um, uh, uh, obviously think alike on this, but we're also about to be neighbours in Ibiza because he's. I think you've oh, bought yeah. it, about to buy a house in Ibiza, so um, we'll be able to to over vegan burgers. Uh, uh, you know, chew the fat, but probably the wrong thing to say, but something equivalent to that on a regular basis, which is wonderful. <laughs> Um, now, we've had a, a, a message here from uh, the Magic Caviar team who, who asked, do you think it's detrimental for a celeb project, in our case, cell-based caviar, to start with a high price niche product and then expand into a mass market product such as cell-based chicken eggs? Uh, they do go on to explain their rationale, but it, it just, it, uh, Jeremy, it, uh, if I could just get your, your view on that. I, the, the key is to get into the market and have some sales. You know, um, so so I, I haven't seen the question, but is 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 that is that what technology are they using? Uh, well, I'll, I'll give you the additional information here. So it says our rationale is quite pragmatic as the development of oocytes. I hope I'm pronouncing that correctly. Which is, uh, egg cells, cells requires most requires of the same technology, technology and SOP, and SOP irrespective of the product. Of the product. Um, um, I don't know if that helps. That helps. <laughs> <laughs> no, but I, if if it is cell based, um, you know, there's it. If they're going to pivot a number of times during during working through the technology, so um, you know, ca caviar is a niche product. Um, but it, it's it's about producing goods for sale. I I, I don't, the, you know, getting it from the lab to the table is 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 what it's all about for cellular. So and I don't think it you know whatever market one approaches, once you've got the technology, it's going to be adaptable to other consumables. Thanks, Jeremy. Uh, Jim, anything to add to that one? Uh, only that, Tim, you're echoing a lot, actually. <laughs> Apologies, um, I've got multiple devices. I'll try and try and. Uh, yeah, uh, I can hear Jeremy clearly, and I think someone just put a question up saying, "Could you? So could someone mute?" Um, Let me mute. Hang on. That is probably but look, not. I mean, I'll just just very briefly add that uh, you know the niche markets are there. So things like kangaroo meat in Australia, fur in Russia. Um, you know, caviar, foie gras, etc. But honestly, there's such a big addressable market in the low hanging fruit. Why would you bother? So I just think we we focus on, you know, on the on the obvious ones uh, that are, are going to be closest to market. Because Jeremy's absolutely right. Uh, you know, the proof of the pudding is getting the product into people's mouths. And, and I'll, I'll give you an example. May I give an example of of Geltor? Geltor is uh, making brewing, biofermenting gelatin. Now, to get approvals for that is going to take longer than it would to um, put it into lipstick. So their first batch of collagen gelatin was sold to, because I don't know if everyone on this call knows, but lipstick typically has pig's gelatin in it. So, you know, putting a lipstick on a pig is probably the wrong way round, um, but because you, but um, um, you know, if you can make an alternative like collagen that absorbs even better than pig's collagen, which is the nearest to our skin type for absorption of all animals, um, then then you know, get it in the market fast, and and actually, what happens then is you've got proof of concept. And valuations, uh, they've just raised, they've just raised at a uh, hundred million, um, at, at just under a half a billion market value. So, um, and really, what they had done was, uh, I'm not sure how much I'm saying of this, and we we do keep confidentiality. It has been in 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 the papers. This, um, they, you know, it's proof of concept is so powerful. And so you can go, so going from cosmetics to, to food is, is, is potentially a 
an easier way round sometimes for the actual food tech as opposed to plant based. Thanks. Now, we've got an interesting question from Sam. Uh, so Sam asks, when there are, for example, 10 cultivated chicken producers, do you think the key competitive differentiation between them will be price, or are there other areas they can compete? Uh, I'll, I'll, yeah, I'll go, go, go to Jim I'll, on I'll, that one. If I'll just right. quickly have a stab at that answer. There won't be 10 chicken producers producing the same chicken because uh, as Jeremy and I both said, the IP uh, is highly it's different to interest. And, uh, you know, th th you can't, you could get Jeremy and I, or you and I, or Lou and I, or any combination of us could go out and start our own plant food company tomorrow, but we couldn't do it with uh, cultivated uh, uh, the, the agriculture. We can't do it because there's so much uh, IP involved. So it's very unlikely there'll be 10 producers. Um, and uh, so it's not really an issue for us because the, the companies that they defend their patents uh, will be able to go plow their own furrows and, and uh, to, to develop their own products without fear of competition, at least for the period of the patent. If I can add, if I can add to that, um, and once again, you've got amazing tasting and you've got now you've got amazing tasting plant based chicken, but there's no real barrier to entry unless, um, you know, it's about again about taste and brand, etc. And first mover advantage. Um, but and as uh, all of us have said, the I IP is is what is attracting to recombinant and uh, cell based. Great. Uh, I think we've got time just trying to squeeze in one last question, if that's all right, chaps. Um, so a question here from uh, Marja or, or Maya, apologies if I'm mispronouncing that. Um, as an angel investor keen to get into the alternative meat space, are there any funds, incubators or investor groups you can recommend? Uh, Jeremy, would you like to kick us off with that one? Sorry, what was the question again? I was getting the echo. <laughs> Apologies. Uh, as an angel investor keen to get into the alternative meat space, are there any funds, incubators or investor groups you can recommend? Um, th this is as an angel investor. Yes, but I think as, as, as any private investor, uh, generally, I suspect would also be interested in, uh, in the options available. Yeah, well, I, I think possibly the best way is to invest in 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 funds and ask for co-investments. You know, so so and you know, all you have to do is look at. Uh, yeah, I, I mean, th there's very few opportunities to invest in in a vehicle. Um, I mean, there's a lot of food tech funds being raised. There are a lot of food tech funds. You know, everyone. Now I'm, now I'm, hold on, sorry, e everyone is, is an expert on food, you know, we do it every day, and you've got, everyone is, has got a better recipe, so you've got all these food tech funds starting out, and that's probably the best way to do it, the only, the only public one I know is, is Jim's, Jim's associate, agronomics. Thanks, Jim. In which case, I'll, I'll, I'll let you finish off with that one. Well, I mean, all I can say is that um, agronomics is about a hundred million, maybe a little bit more than a hundred million dollar fund, um, and it was, it's, uh, you know, got a portfolio of fourteen of these companies. Um, I, I, I personally think it's it's an excellent uh, way for retail investors to invest. Uh, you know, wealthy investors such as Jeremy uh, go into A series, B series, seed funds, and all that sort of stuff. Uh, Agronomics does it because it's an agglomeration of smaller investors um, who have some combined buying power. Um, and, you know, Agronomics doesn't have a management fee, it only has a, a back end performance fee. So there's no ongoing management fee. Um, I, I personally, I'm very happy to be an investor in it. 
Thank you both. Uh, that has been absolutely fascinating. Um, I'll, uh, I'll let you sort of uh, crack on with the, uh, the rest of your days whilst we take a, uh, a quick seven minute break, give everyone a chance to get a, a, a cup of tea. So Jeremy, Jim, thank you both. Thank you. Thank you. Bye, Jeremy. Bye, bye.